Welcome to the Culture Lab. I'm your host, Aga Bayer. This podcast helps you turn your company culture into rocket fuel for meaningful growth. It explores how we can make the word work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. It looks at how we can build remarkable cultures that scale as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. So our definition of of leadership is that leadership is about making others better, first as a result of our presence, and then in such a way that it lasts into our absence. So we, we think that there are three really important words there, others, presence, absence. And the first mistake we've already talked about, which is that leaders can make it about them. The making others, once you get that, uh, we usually realize, okay, we're going to make people better as a result of our presence. And then we mistakenly think it's okay if after we leave, things fall apart. In fact, we might even get a little bit of an ego boost because, you know, I was statistically significant when I was <laughs> there, it went up, and when I wasn't there, it went down. And we're really trying to disabuse that idea and that our job when we are there is to prepare people for when we're gone. And that the true testament to leadership is how well people do when we're not in the room. This episode is brought to you by Culture Brand, a one of a kind global community for leaders and culture champions who want to learn new ways of cultivating remarkable cultures at scale in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. The Culture Brain community is where we come together to answer some pretty darn hard, ungoogleable questions about culture. And our members get to participate in things like weekly huddles, masterclasses, flash mastermind groups, and talks from world-class experts on culture. And you know many of these experts from this podcast. But most importantly, we facilitate deep peer-to-peer connections. Because making work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging, it's definitely not a task for a single person. It requires tapping into the collective wisdom of bold, kind, and curious culture leaders who are on a mission to redefine and, frankly, decrapify work. So if this sounds like something you'd like to be a part of, check it out at tiny.one forward slash culturebrained. And don't worry, you don't have to write it down. There is a link in the show notes. Hey, hey, everybody. So we are doing a rerun today, and this is one of my favorite conversations of 2021. And in case you missed it, I thought that you might want to hear it. So when Google, Uber, WeWork, Riot Games, or other high-growth companies need help with their culture and leadership, they call my guests today, Francis Fry and N. Morris. Francis Fry is a professor of technology and operations management at Harvard Business School. And her wife, Anne Morris, is the executive founder of the Leadership Consortium. They supported a growing list of companies with culture change. And they also wrote a wonderful book on leadership called Unleashed, the Unapologetic Leader's Guide to Empowering Everyone Around You. So this interview, it was such a fun conversation. We laughed a ton, as you will hear. And we talked about deeply important issues. Issues that are really critical for anyone who's out there in the trenches, building great teams and striving to cultivate a thriving culture. We talked about trust, how to build it and how to rebuild it after we lost it. We talked about the importance of setting high standards and having deep devotion at the same time. Something that Frances and Anne refer to as love in the workplace. And they share examples of leaders who exemplify this value and practice of love and of tough love as well at work. And they talk about how this helps these leaders to achieve astonishing business results. And there's so, so much more in this episode. And finally, a quick note. We recorded this episode in December 2020. And so there are some references to COVID that are slightly out of date. But the content and the messages, they are more relevant than ever. Enjoy. Here is Francis Fry and Anne Morris. 
Hi, my name is Frances Fry. I'm a professor at the Harvard Business School, and I try to help individuals and organizations overcome obstacles to excellence. Welcome, Frances. And hello, Anne. So efficient. I love it. Uh, my name is Anne Morris. I am um, w- <laughs> wife of Francis. <laughs> and wife of Anne. <laughs> um, uh, I think probably uh, the simplest identity for me is, is entrepreneur and writer, uh, which are the two things I think most about. But I also spend quite a bit of time coaching entrepreneurs and, and leaders who are trying to take a swing at, at big change in their organizations. And Francis and I do a lot of work together for organizations, helping them uh, achieve excellence. We do all of our most important work together. This is awesome. And I'm so excited to have a duo like you on the show because usually we just do one-to-one and it's so exciting to have um, a couple. So predictable. A single guest. It's just so predictable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this, is, this is going to be probably completely unpredictable and also <laughs> really, really different. And so I'm excited to do this with you and also super curious about what it's like to be working with your spouse um, because I, I won't lie, I've been flirting with this idea of what Working with my husband, but I'm very hesitant. So this is a conversation to oh, be had. Oh, so. you're very pro. <laughs> yes. And, and yeah. you can turn off the recording if that would be helpful to you <laughs> at, at any time. Yes. But Delighted to talk about we're it. We're very pro and we can give you some, some tips to the extent that they're helpful. I would love some tips. Okay. So we'll definitely get there. And I'm even suspecting that probably for a lot of our listeners, this might be quite useful as well. Um, <laughs> because a lar- large portion of our listeners are entrepreneurs and there are various types of partnerships happening, but obviously partnerships with family members as well. So we definitely have a lot to learn from you. So, but before we go there, I, um, I want to ask a question that um, I ask all our guests at the very beginning. And the question is about the early cultural influences that shaped you as a person. So, you know, take turns, but I'm curious, you know, how did you grow up and what impact it had on who you are today? Yeah, it's a it's a wonderful question, and um, I think particularly for entrepreneurs, so important to ref- <laughs> reflect on those early influences and assumptions because we bring them into organizations without realizing it, and we, in small organizations, they have an outsized impact. So, um, I guess I'll start with family, which is where I think it probably begins for all of us. Uh, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the heart of the Midwest. Um, I uh, was raised by a single mom, lost my father at a very young age. She was, uh, she was an entrepreneur in her own way in real estate. And I think probably what was most useful about family culture to me looking back is I think be- both by design uh, because of the way she parented, but also because there were, I had, I had a number of siblings and there, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of room for uh, super hands-on parental involvement, there was a lot of room to experiment and failure was okay. And it was okay to be myself. Um, and those were really powerful lessons to learn at a young age. I think the other major influences on me, uh, were probably team sports. I think, Mm -hmm. um, the, the metaphor of coach as leader, um, where your job is to set the conditions for success, but you're fundamentally on the sidelines while other people perform. I think that was a really powerful early lesson for me. Uh, I also spent early part of my career uh, doing public health work in rural Latin America, where um, I had to set individuals and volunteers up for success with um, with very little room to communicate with them. And I think that's also where this idea of absence leadership that we develop in our book where culture is really one of your main levers. Uh, that was one place that I, I had to learn that the hard way. And mm. finally, and I'll, I'll shut up and let my wife. <laughs> no, <laughs> I love that. I love um, I She's think, learning about you now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, my early experiences with entrepreneurship, I started a company in the biotech space here in Boston. And um, I learned early on that you, can't really tell smart creative scientists what to do, which was which was very frustrating to our board of directors. <laughs> uh, but you can really only give them cultural north stars. So one of ours, for example, was that our 
our mandate as an organization um, was about impact, um, not first and and kind of scientific breakthrough second, which was a new way of thinking for a lot of our scientists. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it was really about applying the scientists, applying the science and making it useful to the world, uh, not just making discoveries and, and, you know, adding, adding to their publication uh, resume. So um, I think uh, figuring out how to influence very smart, very creative people um, without having traditional tools of command and control, I think uh, really, really shaped the way I thought about leadership. Mm. That's beautiful. Um, beautiful. So fascinating and so interesting to learn all of that. And definitely I want to unpack a few things that you've mentioned. But before that, I definitely want to hear from Francis as well. Sure. And so I'll use this, a similar scaffolding. Uh, so family, I'm the youngest of six. My mom was 25 when she had me. So we were all very sort of, um, we were all very near in age. Anne and I are both the youngest, which mm. uh, I think probably helps us a lot. Um, <laughs> yes. Got a couple of yes. I got a couple of um, quirks, but uh, because there's a there's some invisibility that happens when you're the youngest, um, mm. which was totally liberating. Um, so that was the sort of the highlight. The low light of it is that I felt like I didn't receive a lot of the memos that everyone else received on <laughs> <laughs> what to do and how to do it. Uh, I now in my adult life, I refer to these as the secret memos. <laughs> but since I was not given them growing up, I have made it a mission to provide them to others anywhere I can. Right. Um, uh-huh. That's the family what, side. What were some of them? Can you throw in just one? Yeah, I'll throw to get in us one that's, I don't know if this is going to help your readers or not. But, um, so I'm four girls, two boys, I'm the youngest. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was a complete surprise to me when um, the first time that time of the month came around. Mm. Um, That just seems like a secret memo I should have received. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, Three sisters all within. You you should have gotten gotten that one. So I can give others, but I think that one really. Right, right. That one really does it. Yeah. Um, so I think family there, sports as well. I um, huge influence for you. Yeah, huge yeah. influence for me. I ended up playing basketball in college, um, but but played sports throughout my life. Was really known as someone who loved sports. Happened to also be good at math, um, but it, but sports was the driving force to me. Even as I went and got my PhD, um, I thought I was going to go be a coach, uh, a basketball yeah. coach. Um, Academia was really your fallback career. <laughs> With certainty, <laughs> academia was my fallback career. Uh, worked, and I'm and I'm a coach in academia, so it has yeah. all it has all worked out. Um, That's amazing on that part. And then I I guess the last part is uh, as I reflect back, I can remember uh, going down the hill. I grew up in a very small town and padding down the hill in seventh grade, and there was a a, a little country store there. And I went in and I asked if I could work. Um, from opening until noon on the days that there, that we didn't have school. And, uh, so I did my first negotiation mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, and I negotiated for a dollar 25 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so in this, I would work like 16 hours a week and I get a $20 the, bill. The, the gap <laughs> is like a child labor <laughs> on Long Island. <laughs> and so I realized then I'm super good at negotiating for others and uh-huh. uh, not great at negotiating for yeah. myself. So I, that was the last negotiation I did for myself. <laughs> now you have others doing yeah. it for you. That's a good strategy. Yeah. Oh my God, I love it. And there's so much um, I would like to dive a little bit deeper into. And first of all, I just want to say we have one thing in common in that, oh, I wasn't, I'm, I'm not a basketball coach, but I used to play basketball as well. Nice. And yeah. And my dad was actually the coach of the team. And, and this was actually the beginning of my journey with culture because my dad had this thing called um, his playbook and he would clip in all the game plans into the playbook. Um, but he also had like two first pages laminated and I was always curious about what it was. And he said, well, this is my coaching philosophy and some of the principles that um, I want my team to um, keep in mind um, when 
you know, they play and, and generally in how they approach this game. And today, I guess we would talk about those things as values. And it was so interesting to see that he had those things that were never changing. Um, we love lemonade. Really- we love lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Isn't it amazing? <laughs> <Such> confidence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it took him some time before he laminated them because he did iterate. But eventually, yes, he was confident enough to laminate those pages. It was so funny. And recently I spoke to him, just wanted to get it right. And he said, listen, I don't have the laminated ver- version anymore. It's uh, just so outdated. So I have everything digitized now. So he's 80 years old, by, mm. old, by the way. But yeah, it's, it's been digitized. Uh, oh my goodness. Amazing background and such interesting stories. Thanks for sharing this. Um, and I want to talk obviously about your book and also pick up some of the themes that that you've mentioned, but let's start with the book. So you've done a lot of things together, as you said, one of those things that you've done together is an amazing book called Unleashed, the Unapologetic Leader's Guide to Empowering Everyone Around You. And um, I loved it. Uh, I would definitely recommend uh, everyone who listens to the show to get the book and read it. And this is how you open the first chapter. You say, there are a lot of books about leadership, many of them terrific, and humans have been dwelling on the practice and mystery of great leadership for millennia. So why read one more? And so I want to turn the tables on you and ask, why write one more? I'd say that it's, and Anne and I were just looking at each other, one um, being polite, but you go first. No, you go first. So I won. (laughs) Congrats. Um, Well done. Because what we were uh, observing in practice of the leaders who would win, and we are ridiculously competitive. Uh, Another double click we can go through, but ridiculously competitive. And so we like to help individuals and organizations win. And the leaders we saw that were leading organizations to win w- did not have their central tendency in what we were reading in the book. So the books was teaching leaders how to be more leaderly and getting leaders to focus more on themselves and understand their weaknesses and really dwell on themselves. But in practice, we found just the opposite, that the leaders who were um, purposely not dwelling on themselves and putting all of their energy on others, they were the ones that were winning. And so we thought it was worthwhile for us to share our observations in the context of what um, had also been written about leadership. In practice, the pattern we observed in organizations is that leaders, all, all the pre- and some of these pressures are very recent, some of it's social media and, yeah. and the stakes of getting things wrong and, and leading in public have have all you know, slowly and sometimes dramatically gone up over the last decade. Um, But all of these pressures were leading leaders to turn inward uh, at precisely the moment when the challenges of leadership were getting more complex and required more and more that they turn outward. And a a metaphor we like to use is, you know, (laughs) stop looking at the mirror and start looking out the window. Um, (laughs) And uh, and so we wrote the book really um, as a letter to practitioners who are really in the ring building companies and changing companies and trying to have impact at the scale of organizations and beyond. And it was everything we had learned in the last 20 years of trying to do all of those things ourselves. Yeah. And I so completely resonate with that because this is exactly, this has been my observation as well, not just in reviewing literature and what has been available out there for leaders to read, but also in what people do when they face a difficult situation, which is, as you say, this tendency to um, have this inward focus and try to figure out how how do I make this right and putting a lot of pressure on ourselves as leaders rather than thinking how can I enable others to figure things out and drive us forward. And I have to say, I love and admire the simplicity and clarity of Unleashed. Um, for me, I can tell that it's a result of many years of reflection and work and and experimenting with these ideas. And I also love how you structured the whole book because it basically consists of two parts. 
presence and absence, which is so, so elegant. Mm-hmm. And, you know, writing, writing my second book right now, I really notice those things as, as you would. I mean, trying to figure out what others are doing that I really admire. And I was blown away by that. So really amazing. And presence and absence are linked to your brilliant definition of leadership. So first of all, do you want to share it with our listeners, how you define leadership? Because I think it's really probably one of my favorite ones alongside John Quincy Adams, who said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more and become more, you are a leader. But I think yours might be even better. So well, it's uh, it's related. So um, Anne's middle name is Adams, descended from... <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> Uncle John. <laughs> so, so the apple didn't fall very far from the tree. Uh-huh. Um, uh, so our definition of, of leadership is that leadership is about making others better, first as a result of our presence, and then in such a way that it lasts into our absence. So we we think that there are three really important words there: others, presence, absence, and. Um, The first mistake we've already talked about, which is that leaders can make it about them. Mm -hmm. The making others, once you get that, uh, we usually realize, okay, we're going to make people better as a result of our presence. And then we mistakenly think it's okay if after we leave, things fall apart. In fact, Mm -hmm. we might even get a little bit of an ego boost because, Mm -hmm. you know, I was statistically significant when I was (laughs) there (laughs) and when I wasn't there, it went down. Um, And we're really trying to disabuse that idea and that our job when we are there is to prepare people for when we're gone. And that the true testament to leadership is how well people do when we're not in the room. And gone could be on to the next job. It could be went home for the evening. It could be away for the weekend. It could be left the company altogether. There's a mm-hmm. lot of gone. And the, you know, Anne often points out that for large companies, the CEO may never meet some of the employees in the company. So it's yeah. mostly in the absence or during this pandemic, we're mm-hmm. mostly in the absence of people. And so how can we lead in a way that people thrive in our absence? It's a, it's an additional set of skills. And we, um, we wanted to provide the secret memos on how to thrive in that context. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's absolutely wonderful. And I think, um, it would be super useful for our listeners if you could elaborate a little bit, maybe give us a couple of um, ideas of what to do, first of all, to enable people to thrive in our presence. So what should we be paying attention to? What are the uh, priorities to focus on? Yeah, in, well, in the book, we um, we start with trust, which really we we couldn't feel strongly more strongly that it is the foundation of leadership so building trust with uh the the people around you and being super aware of when that trust falters and uh, addressing it uh, in a timely way so we we spend quite a bit of time in the book going through the the pitfalls and and where trust can break down but it is it is step one for sure on the leadership ladder with a super practical how to in how to build yes. it and how to rebuild it like super practical yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yes um, and so you know we when the way we think about trust which again goes goes back millennia to the way Aristotle thought about it um, is that trust requires three things uh, in a relationship it requires logic. You know, we have to believe that you know where you're leading us mm-hmm. uh, and that it makes sense. It has to, yeah. it requires authenticity. We have to believe that we are seeing the real you and your true motivations and you're telling us the truth. Uh, and it also requires empathy. We have to really believe um, that you are not just in it for yourself, but you're also in it for our well-being. And if you just look, I mean, take take this crisis that we're all living through. And if you look at the leaders who are really, really succeeding in this moment. Um, first of all, most of them happen to be women, a- as an aside. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you break down why they're effective um, through the lens of trust uh, and through the lens of logic, authenticity, and empathy, you can really see um, how essential trust is to creating the context uh, for you to have impact, but also to enable other people uh, to have their own impact, which is yeah. really the superpower of leadership. 
And this, and the yeah. flip side to what Anne didn't say there is that you can also see the leaders who are not thriving in this context mm-hmm. you can pretty quickly get, is it all about them? Mm-hmm. Is, do they have a plan, but it's a very secret plan or a plan that is self-contradicting? Um, and are you really questioning who they are in this moment and is it, and whether or not they're telling you the truth? Yes, absolutely. And Oh my goodness. I, uh, I agree 100% with what you have just said. And I've been thinking about examples that have inspired me in, in these past days. Um, and actually it was a woman leader and out of all people, Angela Merkel, actually, when she said, basically we're canceling Christmas this year in Germany <laughs> because, um, they had to introduce very strict lockdown and the way she communicated it was so authentic and so honest and so logical that it, to me, it was completely irresistible. This was the best message during the pandemic that I have ever had. And the only thing that she said was from the bottom of my heart, I am sorry, but if we're losing 500 people per day, this is not acceptable. That was it. Yeah. That's what she said. Yeah. And it was so, so powerful. So powerful. And I, I mean, as your listeners, I'm sure know, Germany is a country that really loves Christmas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's just to buy things here in America and it, you know, it lasts about 48 hours. Uh, yeah. But in Christmas, I mean, in Germany, it's a whole season. Huge. And so, yeah. For for her to stand up and say and say what she said, I you I mean you just you just gave me uh, the, you know I just felt it in my bones there, mm-hmm. uh, and it, it was incredibly powerful and a great yeah. example. And and her her ability to build trust, I think, is truly legendary. Exceptional. Legendary. Mm-hmm. We, so legendary. We, really. You were in the first mm-hmm. part of presence leadership trust. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you making me do the work here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so, you know, trust is the starting point. Um, yeah. but when we talk about presence, we also talk about the, the mechanics of setting another person up to succeed and the context of setting high standards and revealing deep devotion. And here's the trick at, at the same time. So usually, uh, our human nature is the default to one, uh, to the exclusion of the other, either revealing devotion or setting high standards. And the pattern there is is also super clear that the leaders who succeed really in this task of enabling others create the con. They start with trust, but then they create a context very deliberately uh, where others can excel. Mm. We call that love. We call yeah. We yeah. call that love. I you know I so appreciate you're using the word elegant. That's how we saw <laughs> <laughs> the framework. You know it uh, it can read as 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 deceptively simple. Um, but this is our definition of, of love in the workplace for sure. So I definitely want to talk about this because I personally struggled with a word, with a word love, um, in my work and in the business context for years. And just this year for the first time, I decided to integrate it into one of the frameworks that I work with, which is called lift and L stands for love. Wonderful. Mm. Um, and yeah, but, but it is diff- a difficult word to introduce, um, into the business context. So I'm curious, how did that word, um, emerge for you? And did you have a little bit of back and forth? Should we be talking about love or not? And how will people perceive it? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. You know, we, we started out calling it tough love mm-hmm. to kind of get, um, get at this simultaneous idea. But it really, um, in our conversations, again, with practitioners, <laughs> you know, um, and we, at the time, we were spending a lot of time in, in tech companies. Um, it, it really emerged from us, for us in those dialogues, that this, this is the highest form of love. Uh, and let's just own it. You know, I think we were hesitant about the word. Uh, and then as we started using it uh, with leaders and and many of them founders and entrepreneurs for whom their organizations were a true extension of who they are as people and the the way they feel about their employees uh is a form of love the way they feel about their customers is a form of love when they're getting it right and we wanted we wanted to capture the the real power of those values i think the yeah. other part is that we we feel like setting the people up for the long term, like setting them up not just for today, but for the long term is an act of love because you can 
you know, you could make someone feel better today, um, or you could set them up um, so that they'll perform better in the future. Uh, this is the case when you have a lot of devotion, but you maybe insidiously lower the standards on someone. And mm-hmm. it feels like you're doing them a favor in the short term, but you're definitely making them worse off in the long term. And so I think that part also is that love is not, um, is not, is not an immediate gratification. It's Mm -hmm. actually a signal that you're preparing, uh, you're preparing someone to thrive in your absence. Um, Yeah. So, um, but we got there, uh, you know, Anne is the writer uh, between the two of us. I went to math camp. I don't think Anne was considering whether or not to go to math camp when she was growing up. (laughs) The only one I was forced to go. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I I instead loved going to math camp uh, in high school. uh, and I forgot now what I was going to well, say. Well, what you what you made me think about too is, you know, I think our natural te- the natural tendency for both of us as parents yeah. is to lower the standards in the name of our devotion to our children. Mm-hmm. So I think it also it also allowed us to hold ourselves accountable, yes. Yes. <laughs> right? In yeah. in forcing us um, up and in, up into the right and what in in the quadrant we call justice. Um, yeah. It is is an, is another substitute for the word love yeah. uh, in this mm-hmm. context. And devotion is necessary, but it's not sufficient. But it's and not standards sufficient. are yeah. necessary, but not sufficient. Yeah. So let's let's bring this to life for people who listen to this. So could you give us some examples of leaders that you've worked with who really manifested that that uh, value and practice of love in the workplace? What did it look like? What did they do? And what impact it had on the people around them? Yeah, I'll start with one, maybe my favorite one. Um, His name is Carlos Rodriguez Pastor. Uh, He's uh, the head of a large company in Peru. CRP is what he goes by. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, And he started with a retail bank serving the emerging middle class, and then he extended into home goods for the emerging middle class and um, movie theater and, you know, just kept going. And so he now serves the emerging middle class in in many ways and he believes more than anyone i have ever seen that people are his most important asset uh so i'll give you one example of what he routinely does i've been going down to peru for about 10 years to uh to teach the executives in the organization and i've taught every executive over the last 10 years um and it was super common for people who had were in the interview process to attend the class that we we mm. would teach down there, wow. and, <laughs> and Carlos attended every class mm. and took notes. I have never seen a CEO <laughs> do this before, wow. and it was to take notes to learn. But it was also people were like it was high standards mm-hmm. <laughs> there too, um, but it was deep devotion. He would learn so much about people, and then he could customize their development plans. And so his. Uh, and he signaled this in the interview process, like, here is a differentiator for our organization, our commitment to education, and I'm walking the talk. So he, to me, is the greatest example mm-hmm. of a leader that is in justice, mm-hmm. in the justice quadrant, high standards and deep devotion, the vast mm-hmm. majority of time. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. I'll, I'll, I'll add two more to the mix here. Um one, uh, one CEO who inspires us a lot is Lisa Su, yeah. who's um, the first female CEO of a semiconductor company. She's the CEO of AMD mm-hmm. uh, and has led an astonishing turnaround. Astonishing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, if you just look at stock price mm-hmm. as a measure of performance, which I know is imperfect, um, but there's just no ambiguity about her impact as a leader. Uh, she you know, part of her success was creating this culture of relentless improvement. Yeah. And uh, one of the artifacts, and we can get to this word artifact later, which we have stolen from Edgar Schein, one of the original culture scholars, but one of the artifacts of that is uh, something at AMD that they call the 5% rule, which is a commitment to get a little bit better at mm-hmm. uh, task every single time the company <laughs> performs it, right? Which, but what I love about the five percent is it's not this absurd like fifty yeah. percent, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's not comfort with the status it's quo. Definitely not comfort <laughs> with right? the status quo. So it is. It, it reflects an awareness yeah. of how hard this is, 
Mm -hmm. um, but also an unwillingness to lower the standards. And a relentless, the, the relentlessness is yeah. just delicious. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, and I'll give you, I'll give you one more example, um, which is Fred Smith, who uh, was the, was the founder of FedEx. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example from, from, the early chapters of FedEx yeah. where the company was really struggling. So um, this was a moment when, and people forget this because not, the company yeah. is, is this astonishing success, but the company was really struggling for many, many, many years. And Fred kept swinging. <laughs> I mean, he, he actually uh, took the, <laughs> took some of the company capital and and went to Las Vegas and somehow translated his winning. We do not recommend just no. a quick. Okay, this is this is really not a good idea. And again, we're questioning the legality of it. Um, but it, it, I mean, basically, the company was on the ropes and failure was looking imminent. And a uh, customer called in tears uh, because her wedding dress hadn't arrived and she was getting married the next day. Mm -hmm. So there was a frontline service employee and uh, we hadn't, her name is, was Diane. We have not been able to find her last name. If anybody <laughs> out there knows it, please tell us. <laughs> we hate tell yes, Diane, please. A send us a female, you know, service <laughs> provider without having a last name. But she, um, she asked no one for permission yeah. uh, and essentially chartered a Cessna, yep. a private plane to make sure it got there in time. Mm -hmm. Now, this decision created so much buzz at the wedding <laughs> that um, the, some senior executives who were attending as guests were so impressed uh, that when they when they went home on Monday, they called a, a, a wobbly FedEx <laughs> and, uh, and and hired them, and that lifeline, uh, in retrospect, saved the company mm -hmm. um, and gave it the time and capital it needed to get its feet under itself. Now. It reflected this bleeding, cult he called it yeah, bleeding purple, uh, this culture that Fred Smith had built that had this, again, like get it done ethos, this like high yeah. standards, um, but also signaling that every single person on the team mattered. Mm -hmm. that they were seen, they were named, they were claimed, <laughs> they were a critical part of the team, whoever you were in the hierarchy. And it yeah. was that culture that allowed uh, this frontline employee to step up and, and save the company and save the company. Mm -hmm. uh, totally. And, and people felt uh, giving people that autonomy to act also. I think that a lot of companies struggle to create this environment where a person would not only feel compelled to do it, but also be bold enough and know that they have the space to take an action like that. And not be terrified. Right. Like, yeah. And not be terrified. Yeah, yeah. I'll be terrified. This is yeah. really hard. So this is an amazing example of creating a culture that really enables people within the company thrive and take take the company to the next level as a result. Um, I love the story and you include it in your book. Um, it was one of the stories that definitely um, resonated with me. What a wonderful example. Um, and are there any moments where people had to be really hard with their employees. So, you know, to show that tough love or justice in a strict form that actually had a really positive impact. Because I think when when people think about tough love or this idea of justice, I think for, for many of us, it's it feels a little bit like an uncomfortable spot. And I think it's because we have this tendency to want to be nice rather than kind sometimes. Netflix has a very interesting culture. Um, it, its culture is interesting because it's not for everyone, but it's super focused and super specific and really good for them. And, and they have these people that are innovators and mavericks and you just need to stay out of their way. And if you get too much in their way, they'll be very sad. <laughs> um, so their expense policy famously is act in Netflix best interest. Mm -hmm. The expense policy of Full every stop. other organization is like, dozens of pages long, right. with all kinds of caveats. Um, but that wouldn't work at Netflix. So it's a very specific culture. They, um, and, and Patty McCord has written about the culture and Reed Hastings has written about the culture. Um, but one of the, one of the things that really stands out is that if you get, um, average performance, you'll get generous severance. Mm -hmm. So it is an organization that, uh, is just 
relentlessly high performance and not everyone is on an upward trajectory and yeah. there's no shame with it. In fact, they'll treat you with dignity on the way out, but you will be on your way out. Mm -hmm. um, and I really love the generous severance part. Yes. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so it seems like it has integrity all the way around, but I think this one, uh, you know, this is not touchy feely. Yes. And, and they talk about doing business and creating a healthy culture as a, like, like a sports team, which I think makes sense in the context, of course, that if someone is not performing up to your standards, they just need to leave because a team is way more important than an individual. Um, and as you say, it's not for everyone for sure, but definitely works for Netflix. Um, they, they've reinvented themselves uh, a few times by now and are doing extremely well. So obviously there is a method to this madness. And I know also of another organization, the Zappos, right? And they had um, the um, um, an amount um, that people could claim if they decided to quit after um, the, the first six months, I think. So there was always uh, this possibility to opt out and again, get um, some money. Um, so that you leave, actually, because you feel like Zappos is not the place for you, which I think is also great. Yeah, because... a beautiful thing. And Anne and I wrote, we we wrote our first book quite a while ago called Uncommon Service. And Zappos was one mm -hmm. of the organizations we wrote about. And Tony Shea, may he, may he rest in peace. Yeah. Um, he was really a pioneer in many aspects of the culture you know, the one that you mentioned that everyone has to opt in and they had to keep increasing the amount of money they would pay you to hmm. leave to make it a credible amount. And they didn't just offer it to the low performers. They offered it to everyone, mm -hmm. um, which was a, a really quite exceptional thing. Yeah. The other thing about Zappos on their culture that really stood out to us is the way in which they treated their suppliers. So there's like legendary stories of how organizations with market power just beat up their suppliers. Mm. And Zappos had exactly the opposite view. They were like, everything we sell, someone else sells to. <laughs> everything. Yeah. So one way we can differentiate is if we extend our magnificent culture to suppliers. So they would go and pick suppliers up at the airport. They would treat them as well as they would treat any guests. They would have parades for them. Like mm. the VIPs, if there was a VIP on site at, at Zappos, it was a supplier. Mm -hmm. And for sure, suppliers were not treated that way in no. any other company they went to. So, of course, if there was a shortage, Zappos was the first one to receive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And I think it, this is a really nice segue to move to the second part of your book, um, which is around absence, because the stuff that we started talking about, which is culture and strategy, um, are part of how do you manage people, if we can use this word manage, maybe how do you lead people um, in your absence so that they can thrive in your absence as well. Um, so tell me a little bit more about that. How do you set things up so that indeed when you are not there and you've, man you've mentioned so many situations and scenarios where realistically you cannot be there with your people. So you need a great strategy. You need a great culture. Where do you start? Yeah, it's so our sense is you start with the strategy um, and the strategy, like if you're in an existing company, the strategy may be well defined, but it's likely not well understood. And so the first thing is to how to get a deep understanding of the strategy throughout the whole organization. So Diane at FedEx had a deep understanding of the inner workings of FedEx and she was able to take a decision. So you want to have the strategy, if it's, you know, if, it, if the strategy is not right, fix it. But the real thing is, how do you communicate strategy so that everybody else can understand it? That's where we, we suggest you start. And here's why. If I'm away from leadership, there are two ways that um, the company has to ensure that I'm going to behave as well as possible. And that is my understanding of the strategy and my experience of the culture. That's it. And so our experience is that understand the strategy first and everywhere where strategy is silent, everywhere where strategy is silent, culture has to fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. So that 
the limits of strategy define the, the objective of culture. And so the sequence we find really matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the quotes that I recently posted um, from something that you both said was exactly that, how culture takes over whenever there is some level of ambiguity and it basically drives people's decisions, even very banal ones, like, do I need to be on time for this meeting or do I answer my client's email first or do I work on the report for my CEO first? What takes priority? Those sort of things. You cannot prescribe all of it. So culture is definitely that thing that is um, driving those decisions. And as you know, this is the Culture Lab podcast, right? So I cannot <laughs> not, <laughs> I cannot not ask this question. Uh, my goodness, how do you unlock the power of culture? How do you shape a culture that can really... Um, fill those blanks where strategy cannot prescribe and process and procedures cannot prescribe? What works in your experience? Yeah, it's it's a great question. And we could talk about this for hours. So we are delighted yeah. to come on this podcast. <laughs> you know, we think of culture as, um, as the unspoken rules of engagement in an organization. You know, the way things are really done <laughs> around here. And as as we've said before, it is the invisible force that guides behavior when the CEO or anyone else with formal authority isn't in the room. And it turns out, even in small organizations, <laughs> most of the time, <laughs> and now more than ever, it's most of the time. So it's yeah. easiest to see these concepts play out in big organizations because, um, as as you said, the you know the the CEO of of Microsoft, like. Satya Nadella is not going to even meet ever in his life, you know, the majority of the people that he's trying to lead and trying to influence. And so all he has is strategy and culture. Now, when you're an entrepreneur in a small organization, you have all these other tools because mm -hmm. people are in your presence. And yet these are still among your most powerful lovers. So that's our starting place. Um, and the first place we start is is, okay, what is the culture that we want to have? How can we be deliberate uh, and not just default to our own assumptions, our own family experience, our own <laughs> early influences of, of, of power and hierarchy? My culture would have secret memos taped everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> or our reaction uh, to those early influences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what, is re what really makes sense for what we're yeah. trying to achieve? The thing about the Netflix story that that is so powerful to me is the clarity. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. The clarity with which, you know, Patty McCord <laughs> uh, and Reed came together and said, mm -hmm. these are the people we need to succeed. Mm -hmm. We're, we're going to give them a name. We're going to call them innovator mavericks. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's super weird about these creatures <laughs> is that mm -hmm. they value freedom and autonomy above everything else in their lives. <laughs> so if we yeah. want to attract these people and set them up to crush it, we have to be really deliberate about the culture that we bring them into. And mm -hmm. this idea of freedom on autonomy really has to be at the center of it. And yeah. we have to thread it. The other beautiful part of the Netflix story is we're going to thread it through every, every single decision we make down to how we write <laughs> our expense policy. Yeah. So that, uh, that, you know, really pushing people to reflect on what do you need for your organization to succeed and what, is, how does that manifest mm -hmm. from a culture standpoint? is a really important fire to walk through. Yeah, totally. So really carefully designed, very intentional and very well thought through and integrated, woven into everything that, that you do, as you say. And, and, and how fast it, I mean, the, yeah. you know, this Netflix culture deck is among the oh. most important artifacts that yeah. come out of Silicon Valley. Uh, and you just, just Google it. Yeah. <laughs> Netflix yeah. culture deck. You get a 145 slide <laughs> deck which mm. clarifies down to each of the cultural values and how they fit in with the strategy and, you know, who fits and who doesn't. And they make it super clear who they want to walk through the door. Yeah. You read that deck and you're like, I'm home yeah. or, oh my <laughs> gosh, get me That's out right. of here. <laughs> which is so great because I think one of the, um, one of the things that can really make or break a company is what people you hire, right? And when you broadcast who you are and what you stand for in, in such a way, immediately, as you say, you attract the right people or 
the people who wouldn't be the right fit, they say, yeah, this is not for me. I definitely can't see myself working in this organization. And it saves you so much trouble. So it's a fantastic tool to attract talent, the right kind of talent, and really being bold and brave about saying what sort of people you need to uh, for your business to succeed. Um, so I have a question around that because I think you know, working with companies around their culture, I can see very often founders and founding teams struggle a little bit around this. So on one hand, of course, you think about what company you want to create, how you want to change the world, what dance do you want to make in the universe, and um, all those uh, lofty ideals. On the other hand, um, you are who you are, and you care about what you care. So there is this element of our cultural DNA that already exists. And my question to you is, have you seen any good examples where um, companies or leadership teams have reconciled those two things really well? Because I think one piece is around who you already are today. And the second piece is around who do we need to become so that we can bring our vision to life? Yeah. So we we most frequently come across this when companies are in trouble. So our phone rings disproportionately when a company has run into a rough patch. And so who they are, they get confronted with is not sufficient. Yeah. And so then they want to go there. There's some that that's not entirely the case, but it's the majority of the case, certainly over the last couple of years. Um, and so what we often find is that who you are, who... Um, is a pretty significant um, shadow of the founder and that we fell into some pretty common habits, which is we really like people who are really like us. Mm. Yeah. And what will have happened is some people who are not like us will have gotten into the company. Other names for that are diversity. <laughs> <laughs> and the folks that are different are not thriving as much as the folks that are similar. And that's a super common way that who we are needs to be different than who we're going to yeah. become. And what we can say is that this is a place where your intentions and instincts are wholly insufficient. Mm -hmm. There's no amount of good instincts and there's no amount of good um, intentions yeah. that are going to help you understand what people who are different than you need to thrive. So mm -hmm. we have to act very deliberately in a much more expansive way. Mm -hmm. And that tends to be a reckoning, well, over the last, you know, certainly in 2020, um, that has been a reckoning for many, many organizations. Yeah. Um, and again, it comes down to as simple as we you can see who's thriving now because it's everyone who's really yes. like us. Um, and we're sad because the, the limits that has on innovation and excellence, and maybe we're starting to get, you know, our lunch eaten by other people who mm -hmm. have more lived experiences and can contribute greater, yeah. um, greater ways. Yeah, totally. And since we are um, talking about how, who we are can stand in the way uh, to success and being able to make the right impact on the world. I want to talk a little bit about the companies that you've worked with, like Uber, WeWork, Riot Games, because for many people, eventually they came to symbolize everything wrong with the Silicon Valley, basically. So I want to ask, what was your experience trying to help them transform their culture and what did you learn from it? Yeah. And so the and the first one started with Uber for um, and it's when Ann and I made the decision uh, and Ann and I worked on it together but I was the one who commuted every week from Cambridge to San Francisco um, and took a leave from Harvard um, but we we consciously made the decision that if we can help companies that are in a lot of trouble and we can help them turn around we are giving a prescription and a roadmap and permission for anyone who's got it less severely to mm -hmm. get better. Yeah. So we went to these organizations precisely because there were problems. Now we're at this point pretty good at helping companies. So we have a great responsibility to make sure that these are good people in these companies because 
the damage we could do is go to a company in trouble because it's got you know loads and loads of evil people and then if we help them that will make us sad <laughs> mm-hmm. so what we do in our due diligence is are these are the vast majority of the people good they have gotten caught in some uh in some behaviors like at Uber for example they're almost all of the problems at Uber uh, were due to the fact that a manager inflicted something on one of their impl- one of their direct reports. Well, no one at Uber had been trained how to manage, and everyone at Uber was in their first job. Mm-hmm. They got hired as an individual contributor. Five minutes later, because of hyper growth, they were put in the position of a manager. Five minutes after that, the manager of a manager, mm-hmm. and no one ever taught them how to do it. So when we went out there, I mean, what's very clear in our mind is that leadership and management can be taught <laughs> from a <laughs> yes <laughs> we very much believe in it um and we found and you know this is the part that's really incredible uber's culture you know we were able to um contribute to it turning around within nine months we separated from 20 people out of thirteen thousand in june of 2017 and so that culture mm-hmm. was like just devastated and it was turned around with the vast majority of the same people and that's our experience. If you go to Riot, if you go to WeWork, it's it's similar percentages. Um, and so we go there so that we can, you know, learn the secret memos. Um, mm-hmm. like we only help good people uh, trying to do noble things. Um, and then we the agreement we make is that we're going to open source it so that everyone else can learn from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one of the pa- one of the patterns um, uh, ac- across young founder led companies no experience like uber like right games mm-hmm. um uh, in, in some ways i mean if we take a step back from the individuals which i think sometimes is hard for the press to do yeah. um you know the the story of you know <laughs> anyway um it, i think it's a lot of it is about the cultural growing pains of moving from a small, relatively homogenous, fast-moving, high-growth organization into an organization that has much greater accountability and responsibility to a much larger number of people, including the mm-hmm. uh, employees showing up. And so I'll give you an example from, from Uber um, that, that we write about. But um, one of the cultural values was always be hustling. Now, it, that makes a ton of sense when uh, you look at the founder's yeah. ride to success, you know, he was hustling his whole life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it made a ton of sense for a young, scrappy organization to like put that on a poster and tack it to the wall and say, you know, like, go, go be scrappy. Yeah. Now, mm-hmm. when you're an organization of thousands of people touching millions of writers, um, always be hustling doesn't make sense for every function in the organization. Mm-hmm. For Legal. example, <laughs> <laughs> compliance <laughs> with international law. That right. is not a function where you should be hustling. That's the function <laughs> where you need to get it right. And so yeah. there comes a point in the evolution of a company, uh, and we think it's earlier than most companies should do it. We think companies need to do this on a much more regular basis, is do a cultural audit do the mm-hmm. assumptions that we're making still make sense? Are the values that we are celebrating, uh, first of all, have they become weaponized? Are we mm-hmm. using them against each other or our stakeholders? And we, we see that frequently. But yes. do they even make sense? Do they even make sense given where we are as an organization and you know our, our level of, of maturity as a, as a company, even from a strategy point of view? Yeah, totally. And and it's probably quite a difficult thing to do, right? Because um, when you start out like Uber, and actually they did put huge emphasis on their values, Kalanik put a huge emphasis of, uh, on the values, and then suddenly you need to reconsider and change, and actually you were part of that process. Um, so I'm curious, what is it like when people have been almost indoctrinated to believe in those things and operate in alignment with those things. And then suddenly you take a turn and you introduce a new set of values. What was the reaction there? Yeah. So I think the way in which you do it matters. And we both, like, we really love mission-driven companies. We love companies that have strong values. Um, And we realize that 
values need to be updated. And we're trying to help organizations do it before they become weaponized. But mm-hmm. um, what we're, you can think is that we have a collection of values and they're sub-optimizing. And so we're going to optimize them. We're going to make them better. And if you do it, the first values probably got handed on from down high, uh, from up high. Yeah. The revision of them should not be. The revision of them should involve every person in the organization that wants to be involved. And we have learned ways to do this. You can do it no matter what size the organization in, you know, 30 to 60 days. But you want to get broad involvement with people um, and in their involvement of what about the existing values is just super precious to you. Mm-hmm. And what about the existing values is the intention good, but the practice mm-hmm. unfortunate. And if you let everyone participate in that stage, what we have found is that you usually keep about 70% of the values, but the new values are of the organization. Mm -hmm. And so you actually get a recommitment just as strong, perhaps even stronger because there's more people behind it. So there is a beautiful thing in the reconceptualizing of the Mm -hmm. values. And as Anne said, the rate of change right now internally and externally is so high that if an organization has not looked at their values in the last five years, I we just have no hesitation in saying uh, we would recommend you do this mm-hmm. exercise. Yeah. I mean, one thing we also experience is, is there's often a lot of relief. Yes. Um, because I think there are a, a lot of people showing up day after day and they know something's wrong and they experience it and they experience it uh, and they observe it for people that they care about. And people are really hungry to solve the problem. And I think, you know, surprising to everyone at the top um, and often uh, observers from the outside is that 70% number. Because yeah. at the beginning of this journey, people, people they're afraid feel, everything. They, they think they have to throw everything yeah. out. And, and mm-hmm. um, typically it's about, uh, as Francis said, recommitting to the values that will continue to serve you. Um, uh, you know, eliminating the ones that don't and bringing on new ones that are important to wherever the organization is and the people who are showing up and the people you want to show up. Mm-hmm. And um, that's a really optimistic journey. It's a super optimistic journey. For most journey. organizations. Yeah. yeah. It's mm-hmm. it's terrifying for the senior leaders, as Anne says, um, and particularly because they won't be very good guessers <laughs> on what's in the 70 and what's right. in the 30. Right. Yeah. Um, and so you have to have faith in the organization, but the truth is the values are for the organization. Yes. Yes. So, so true. And I I love this process and I know that it's super important from personal experience as well to engage the organization, because as you say, leaders very often have blind spots, but also you really want to have the buy-in and tap into what's working and what's not working. And also what people feel is going to take them where they need to go in this next stage of organization's uh, development. Uh, so it makes total, total sense to me. Um, my goodness, where do we go next? I mean, I definitely would love to know what it's like thinking, you know, selfishly, but also about our listeners. Some of them um, are entrepreneurs and maybe are considering working with their family members, spouses, et cetera, et cetera. So tell us about that. What are the key challenges? Because you seem to be so in sync and working so, so well together. So what is the secret sauce of a successful collaboration with a spouse (laughs) or a family member? I love this line of questioning because we have never thought about it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know, we're not in a structured way. Um, I think the headline is we we definitely recommend it. Uh Uh-huh. Um, I think there is. It makes our marriage better. Uh, yes. Really? Um, I yeah. think. In what ways? Our marriage thrives when we're solving hard problems together. Mm-hmm. And it, it gives, it gets us out of being at all narcissistic. And mm-hmm. we're in service of something greater. And I have so much admiration for Anne. And I get mm-hmm. to see it on a daily basis as we're working on hard things. And I get to marvel at what she did. So, we call this Scooby Snacks, but when we give one another like, <laughs> reinforcement, well, when we're working mm-hmm. together, I have cause to give positive reinforcement and to receive positive reinforcement on a practically daily basis. And yeah. it's for things that are like really important, like trying to get the secret memos out to the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's almost like some people have described in this work from home revolution that we're all living through. 
um, that they get to see the, a different side of their spouse mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and they while well, they watch them work, you yeah. know, from the kitchen table. And we get we've been to, seeing that. We've been seeing that for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and it's it is it's so nourishing. And we I'm, are I'm sold already, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing that that helps is that we are very much in sync, but we have super complementary skills. Yeah, like mm-hmm. super complementary. Um, so, what are your superpowers, Francis? And then I'll ask the same to Anne. Well, yeah. I'm a great editor. I'm uh-huh. terrible with a blank sheet of paper. Right. But I'm a great reader and a great editor, and I'm fearless in going out and practicing any ideas that Anne comes up with. <laughs> <laughs> what are your superpowers, Anne? <laughs> You're a wonderful muse, baby. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do think it helps that um, we are very clear about each other's strengths. And so we do have lanes that we respect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, Francis is incredible at the at the front of a room she's uh, an amazing educator um it d- is just her frame on the world is let me understand something so that i can teach it to others and mm-hmm. you know, that that is your driving force uh yeah. at all times i think my um my profile is more kind of artist entrepreneur <laughs> mm-hmm. um and uh, I like to create things. I like to make things. You know, I, I love language. Um, I think we are uh, both equally motivated by, by this idea of helping people realize their potential. I think your preferred modality is a classroom and mine is probably um, a one-on-one kind of coaching uh, yeah. dynamic, uh, which is something I really, really love to do. But what's fun is to bring each other into those yes. domains. To visit. <laughs> to visit. Only to visit. <laughs> like I love, you know, we do a lot of coaching as part of the work we do with companies. It's just, you know, one, one piece of the engagement. Yeah. But there's nothing I enjoy more than bringing Francis into those conversations, mm. particularly if there's someone I'm trying to reach and I know I- I'm having trouble mm-hmm. getting there. And, um, and then it's super fun to come into her classroom sandbox and play and, <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, and yeah. then. You know, what you said in the beginning about the book, which I, I do think is a beautiful book and I do think it's elegant and framing and Anne is a is a beautiful writer. And I used to think that beautiful writers, they just must write great first drafts. And no. that's not it. No. <laughs> it's, yeah. you know, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 drafts. And so when Anne mm. writes something and I read, I'm like, oh my God, that's perfect. Pour liquid cement on it. <laughs> and she's like, no, no, no. It's We're going to tear it down. Oh, and <laughs> and at least I'm like, oh my God, that's perfect. Don't touch it. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. But is, there's a, I mean, there's an analog on the teaching side too. I mean, yes. some of your colleagues uh, I don't say dismiss, but we'll say, oh, you know, Francis can teach the phone book, right? Um, but well, yeah, oh, you're doing this for the hundredth time, mm-hmm. like tearing it down for the hundredth time. <laughs> and I, I get to witness that process and yeah. back to where we started. Um, and it, it's it's really nourishing to the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with Esther Perel and her work. She is. I, I'm, I'm, Anne is beaming. I'm a super fan. Oh my God. Me too. And Not me. <laughs> <laughs> it speaks to our differences. Francis is Listen, Listen, we cannot see each other. So I don't know if they're beaming or not. <laughs> no, we I have this conversation. It's a <laughs> difference. And pro, me, no. Yeah. Okay. Got you. But the thing that you said about how important it is and how it nourishes your relationship when you can see each other doing what you are best at. She talks about this a lot as well. Yeah. So she says how important it is to see your loved one, your spouse, your lover, um, being out in the world and doing what they are best at because it's very erotic, very engaging. And I can totally see that. And I think for a lot of people, they might have had this experience during the pandemic as well, or maybe the opposite as well. I don't know, because I, I'm curious. I really, listeners, if you are listening to this and you have something to say on the topic of what were your experiences witnessing your partners working at home, let us know. I am really curious about this. Thank you for sharing this. This is amazing. I'm definitely sold on the idea of working with um, my husband. Um, he's quite hesitant, but I think that I'll get him there at some point. Um, yes, okay. Would, so the other advice would be to just to find a way uh, <laughs> to talk about it. 
right? To yeah. talk about, to, to check in with each other and, and discuss what's working and what not, what's not working. <laughs> and Scooby snacks are key. Yeah. <laughs> Scooby snacks. Yeah. 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 And actually everything that you have said is I think equally true for non-family or non-personal relationships, partnerships as well. I can't oh, think yeah. of, I mean, yeah. sometimes that founder, that founder relationship is, is as intimate, at least as, intimate, uh, yeah. as a marriage. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it, it totally applies. Yeah. So we have this section in the podcast that is called rapid fire questions. And I have five questions. And the idea is that you'll try to answer them in under two minutes. Right. So are we good to yes, go? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. let's do it. So first question, how do you define organizational culture? You have talked a little bit about this, but give us your definition again. Yes. Uh, the simplest definition, I think, is the unspoken rules of engagement. Uh, the more complicated version is it's the invisible force that guides behavior mm -hmm. when the CEO or anyone else with formal authority isn't in the room. And it turns out those people are not in the room most of the time. And what are the signs that the company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? Means and standard deviations. So means, low means, you have low engagement in the company, as an example, or standard deviations, there are demographic tendencies um, associated with who's thriving. Mm. What company do you admire for the culture and why? We are big admirers of, of Microsoft. So the, the culture was really at the center of, of its recent turnaround and diversity and inclusion is at the center of culture. Kathleen Hogan, uh, Chief People Officer and CEO Satya Nadella, really partnered to um, not only elevate inclusion as a strategic priority, but to make sure that this idea of a growth mindset was really disseminated to everyone in the organization. Yeah, I love them as well. Um, what books on culture or on leadership, or perhaps even outside of this sphere of business books, would you recommend to our listeners? Um, because they are looking for something that will give them an inspiration around how to cultivate a great culture. And it might not necessarily be a business book. I know that you read a lot of uh, philosophy. So perhaps. Yeah, I'll give, we'll, we'll give you three. So okay. one is The Fearless Organization by Amy Edmondson, yeah. which really talks about the importance of psychological safety in a culture, among other things, to make, make sure companies are thriving. Another book is uh, is coming out this spring. Uh, another colleague of ours, Sadal Neely, has written a book called "The Remote Work Revolution." So, mm -hmm. how how does what does culture look like now yeah. when we're all working from anywhere? Really interesting. Yes, really interesting questions. Uh, super practical. And my last endorsement is <laughs> is actually uh, a television show. If you'll indulge me, called Ted Lasso. Uh, you can find it on Apple TV. Uh, it's a comedy. It's about uh, an American football coach who shows up in this very cynical culture of British football. So, you know, we, we call it soccer, mm -hmm. uh, but it really showcases the power of a single individual to, to change things and culture is at the center of the storyline. Oh, I love it. And I've never heard of, of this show. So definitely going to check it out. Um, so finally, what is one thing that our listeners can do tomorrow to build their own culture lab and start cultivating a culture that will help them and their teams to bring their vision to life? Um, the one thing is uh, you're making a decision between should I change a little or change a lot? And we would say fearlessly go towards change a lot. Hmm. Awesome. Do you have any closing remarks, something that you'd like us to um, end on? Yeah, our final thought is is to simply begin. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the journey towards culture change can start at any moment. And our advice is to start right now. You know, the, the chance that you are underestimating the cost of standing still is very, very high that the, it, it is in action in a context where, you know, uh, to Francis's point that not everyone has equal access to thriving is not only we would argue immoral on some levels, but it's also incredibly risky from a strategic standpoint, those human assets that will determine everything, um, are, are very likely to walk out the door. Yeah. Totally. And I know that we haven't really had an opportunity to 
elaborate on that topic. So I'm curious whether you have any recommendations for our listeners where they can find more about how to create an environment that is minimizes bias and that allows everyone to thrive. What, what are the best resources? Because it is so, so hard. And I know that for a lot of our listeners, they have the best intentions, but it's difficult. It's difficult to do it right. So we don't have time to talk about this in detail, but perhaps you have something to recommend in terms yeah, of resources. So- I'll give for self-serving the chapter on belonging in our book and in particular something that we call the inclusion dial Mm -hmm. for this directly. Another place to go and look is a book written by Francesca Gino called Rebel Talent. Mm -hmm. And then what most of your listeners are probably familiar with, but it's worth revisiting, is going to Mazarin Banaji's website on mind bugs Mm -hmm. and and she is the person, the same way that Amy Edmondson, the person who brought us psychological safety, Mazarin Banaji brought us unconscious bias. But yeah. if you go back to the source, as opposed to other people interpreting the source, it's a really nourishing act. Thank you so much. And we're going to put um, everything in the show notes. And what are the best places for our listeners to follow you, learn more about your work or connect with you online? I have a, I have slow twitch muscle. So for me, it's LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm with you. <laughs> Not a Twitter person. <laughs> um, you can find me on Twitter. <laughs> a little bit faster twitch. Um, we also have a website for the book, which is theleadersguide.com. You can find us both on LinkedIn. Uh, and we're, we are delighted to engage. With delighted anyone. to engage. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. It was delightful to have you as guests on the Culture Lab. And I'm sure that our listeners will love what you have shared. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was our selfish pleasure. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast. And this is the Culture Lab team. Production manager, Lindsay Nunez. Art director, Emily Spencer. Aaron Scott. Content editor. Sound producer, James Ead, be heard. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. Frances, Anne, and I, we hope that it will inspire you to think broader and deeper about leadership at your company. And if you'd like an opportunity to interact with guests of the Culture Lab podcast, in live sessions where you can learn more on the topic that we discuss on the show, this is just one of many benefits you'd enjoy if you were a member of the Culture Brain community. So Culture Brain is one of a kind global community for culture leaders who look for new ways of cultivating remarkable cultures in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. If you are in charge of a culture-shaping project, And if you believe that work should be synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging, well, you'd probably feel right at home in our community. It's a really diverse group of culture leaders from Fortune 100 to tiny startups on a rapid growth trajectory. And what brings us together is a passion, a passion for cultivating a healthy culture at scale. We are guided by our values of being bold, being kind, and being curious. And we'd love for you to join us if it feels like the right fit for you. You can learn more about Culture Brained at tiny.one forward slash Culture Brained. And you'll find the link in the show notes. Thanks for tuning in and listening to this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game changing, please share this episode with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, you can do it on any podcast streaming platform of your choice. If you want to receive our weekly insights on cultivating a remarkable, powerful, and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser. tinyurl.com forward slash agabayer. That's T-I-N-Y url.com forward slash A-G-A-B-A-J-E-R. Also, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to it.
And finally, the entire Culture Lab team and our guests, we are going to continue exploring how we can make the word work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging, and how we can build remarkable cultures that scale as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. So, what do you want to hear about next? What matters to you? Email us at lindsay at agabayer.com and let us know.